My name is Micah Van Dyken, and I am the Director of Community Life here at Payless Community Church. And this morning I get to share with you what God's put on my heart this week. And I'm excited because I get to talk about one of our denomination's nine core values. For those of you who are new around here, or maybe you're just checking us out this morning, we belong to a denomination, which is like a community of churches, called ECO. And we joined ECO not too long ago, not because of what they stood against, but because of what they stood for. And so today I want to get into one of these things that we say we're for, and I want to explore it a little bit. Today I want to ask, what does it mean to be missional? Our sixth core value as a denomination is missional centrality. The Eco website explains what that is, saying, we believe in living out the whole of the Great Commission, including evangelism, spiritual formation, compassion, and redemptive justice in our communities and around the world. Maybe you're thinking, well, haven't we always believed that? I think yes and no. Yes, I'm sure all of us who say that Jesus is Lord believe that we should be living out the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations in Jesus' name. But no, that's not all that this core value is saying. It's also getting at how we go about doing that. That's where this word missional comes in. Being missional refers to a certain way of thinking about where and how ministry happens. And it's often compared with being attractional. An attractional approach to ministry is one that says, come to us or come check out our church and see the life that you can find here. This kind of approach emphasizes things like fantastic programs, engaging worship services, and exciting events held at church to draw people into the building. If you like word pictures, think of like a, a city on a hill. This approach tends to, say that, tends to say, come and see what we have to offer and then join us here. A missional approach to ministry, on the other hand, says we'll come to you, or we'll engage you where you already are with this life in Christ that we've found. It's more about meeting people where they are than engaging them where, where they're already at. It's more about going out than drawing in. So for this word picture, I want you to see yourselves as missionaries to your neighborhood. I want you to see yourselves as people given one mission, to make Jesus known in a way that makes sense to the people in your neighborhood. Now, if that intimidates you, maybe thinking about it this way would help. Missional ministry looks like ordinary people doing ordinary things with gospel intentionality. It means living out your everyday life with a bigger mission in mind. Do you see the difference between those two approaches to ministry? Now, before you get too nervous that I'm going to start saying that we've been doing everything wrong for too long, I want you to hear this. As an eco-church, and as a church that cares deeply about the gospel and about people who don't know the gospel yet, we want to be both missional and attractional because we believe that the gospel is both missional and attractional. We definitely want to show people what a gospel-shaped community looks like so that they can see it and so that they can join us here. And of course we want to offer fantastic programs like our new Never Better group or maybe our Vacation Bible School, which I'm sure an army of you will be joining for the, for the lunch afterwards. And we definitely want to work hard to have engaging worship services. We love hosting things like our community band concerts to get people in our doors that we might not otherwise ever get a chance to meet. So we need to be attractional because the gospel is so attractive. But we also need to be missional because the gospel is essentially missional as well. The Great Commission is to go and make disciples. Jesus summarized his ministry by saying that the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And after Jesus rose from the dead, his followers, or he told his followers, as the Father has sent me, now I'm sending you. We have the same mission as Jesus, to seek and save the lost by introducing them to God in a way that they'll actually understand. But how do we do that? What does it look like to be missional? I think, that's the, or I think the best place to start is to look at Jesus. How did he do it? How did Jesus live missionally? And that's where we get to our scripture passage for today. In Philippians chapter 2, Jesus shows us the attitude that it takes to live missionally. And this morning I want to look at four aspects of that attitude. Jesus was humble, he was incarnational, he was a servant, and he was obedient. First of all, Jesus was humble. That's your first fill in the blank if anybody's taking notes this morning. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who though he was in his very nature God, 
did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Jesus was able to live missionally because he humbled himself. He let go of what he could have held on to, and he put himself on the same level as the people that he was ministering to. In other words, Jesus got rid of everything that was holding him back from engaging people who didn't, who didn't know God. Until he became human, Jesus had absolutely everything that most of us have always longed for. He had the most satisfying relationships you can imagine. He had the perfect home. He had more celebrity status than we can dream of. And he had an eternity without pain. Who doesn't want that? But he didn't hold on to any of that. Jesus gave up his privilege as God so that he could engage people who didn't have a relationship with God. Jesus humbled himself, and he started living missionally. And so if we're wondering how to start living missionally, then we can start by asking where we might need to humble ourselves too. I'm not here to tell you that you need to sell your house and go become an international missionary. But I am here to ask you, what might you be holding on to that's keeping you from engaging the people in your life who don't know God? Is taking the time to build a relationship with your neighbors too inconvenient for your schedule? I know for me that's usually the case. Is being open with, about your relationship with your friends or your coworkers just way too uncomfortable? Every time I'm asked what my job is, I kind of hesitate a little bit because I, I, I get uncomfortable saying I'm a youth pastor. Do you feel like you're not old enough yet? Or maybe you're too old and it's somebody else's turn to do the ministry? If something is holding you back from living missionally, like some fears tend to hold me back, I want to challenge you. And I want to challenge myself to humble ourselves and to put ourselves in situations where we can let go of those things and where we can get engaged in Jesus' mission. Not because you need to, not because our church needs you to, and certainly not because God needs you to, but because God is inviting you to. And because doing that will make you more like Jesus. If you're holding on to something that's holding you back from engaging people who don't know God, let it go and lean into Jesus. I can assure you that you'll find that Jesus is better. Let's let him prove it to us. And in order to do that, we need to recognize the second attitude Jesus had as he lived missionally. Jesus was also incarnational. That's your second fill in the blank this morning. In other words, Jesus actually went about engaging people who didn't know God. He was incarnational. That means he took on a body and he became real and relatable to the people around him. Our passage says that he was made in human likeness and found in appearance as a human. Pastor Steve, or Pastor Steve sometimes tells us that people at his last church like to say that they will do anything short of sin to win someone for God. That was Jesus' mentality, too. He entered into our world, and he made himself just like us, short of sin, so that he could reconnect people to God. Jesus became a real person in a real place and ministered by sharing his life with people. His main strategy was to invite 12 people to spend almost all of his waking moments with him. But Jesus also looked for every opportunity he could to engage lost people for God. I think one of the best examples of that was when Jesus met the woman at the well. Jesus and his disciples were on their way home from a work trip in Judea and decided to take the sketchy way back. They ended up needing to take a lunch break in a town in Samaria. That's kind of like an Ohio State fan on their way back home from the UP needing to stay up in Ann Arbor for gas. Not an ideal rest stop, right? And there Jesus saw a woman getting water from a well at the hottest time of the day. It was obvious that she wasn't looking for company. Everybody else had already come and gotten their water hours ago. If Jesus were our Ohio State fan in this situation, this woman would probably be the lady buying groceries at the gas station because shopping at the local, local grocery store would have been too uncomfortable for her. Most people would have just avoided her. But Jesus asked her for a drink. In our gas station scenario again, this is like Jesus stopping this lady coming out of the gas station and asking her for one of the water bottles that she just bought. Can you picture her response? Um, are you kidding me? Are you talking to me? And then Jesus went on to talk to her about politics, her theology, her multiple divorces, the fact that she was living with her boyfriend, and, that, and, and, the, and the reality that he was the only true way to God. I'm pretty sure that's like every taboo topic you're not supposed to talk about. And by the end of their conversation, she was running away, but not because she felt rejected by Jesus. 
She was running to get her friends so they could meet Jesus too. That's how Jesus ministered incarnationally. As a real person who needed to do things like stop and rest and drink. But also as someone who looked for every opportunity to use his normal humanness, his relatability to engage people for God. Even halfway home from a work trip in a sketchy part of town. What might getting engaged like that look like for us as a church? Let me throw out some ideas. Maybe instead of hosting our own things every holiday, we walk down the hill to a program that the Parks Department is doing, and we fill every volunteer spot there we can. Or maybe we just go and hang out and get to know our neighbors. Maybe you can start taking a local class at one of your local rec centers. If anybody's interested, Katie and I have been wanting to take dance lessons for a la very long time. So if you're interested in embarrassing yourself with us, let me know. <laughs> The key is to practice being incarnational people like Jesus, who look for ways that God is inviting us to engage the real lives of the people around us. Who's someone that you can become more present to so that God will become more present to that person too? And as important as being incarnational is, it needs to be paired with the third attitude that Jesus had as he lived out his mission. Jesus was also a servant. That's your third fill in the blank today. In other words, Jesus engaged people who didn't know God for their benefit, not for his. In Matthew chapter 20, right after his disciples were bickering about who would be the greatest in Jesus' new kingdom, he called them together and he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't humble himself and become like us just to hang out. He did it with a purpose, and that purpose was always to serve other people. Have you noticed that Jesus always did what was best for the people around him? Sometimes I'm sure that was easy and fun for him, like when he welcomed little kids, or when he fed 5,000 people. That had to have been a pretty cool time, right? I bet Jesus enjoyed that. But other times, I'm sure it was pretty hard and pretty unpopular, like when he called out the Pharisees on their hypocrisy, or when he kept himself on the cross and forgave the people who mocked him as he hung there. Every time Jesus engaged people who didn't know God, he did what was best for them. And Jesus could do that because he knew what was best for them. Whatever, Jesus, whatever need Jesus saw in people, he knew what they really needed was a relationship with his father. Jesus knew the beauty of the life that they were missing out on. There's a story in Luke about a paralyzed guy whose friends went to a ton of trouble to get to Jesus to, so that he could get to Jesus. They even lowered him through a roof. They destroyed somebody's roof to get to him. But Jesus' first response wasn't to heal this guy. He said his first response was to tell him that his sins were forgiven. He made sure that he was good with God. And it was only after the Pharisees got upset with Jesus that he had done something that only God was supposed to be able to do that he finally healed the guy. Jesus knew that the best thing he had to offer was God. And so as we're considering how we can become more missional, we can recognize that missional ministry isn't just about building relationships and being social. It's doing that for a reason. It's doing what's best for the people around us and looking for opportunities to reconnect them to God. Maybe that means helping that elderly couple across the street with yard work. Or maybe it means babysitting your neighbor's kids for free so that those parents can focus on their marriage. Wink, wink. <laughs> maybe that means having that hard conversation with somebody that you're just dreading, but you know you need to have with them. That's what it looks like to really love them. Or maybe it means sharing with someone that their sins are forgiven because Jesus died on the cross for them so that they could have a relationship with his father. If you're not sure what you can do or what you'd really like to do well, then sign up and come to the new members class tonight at 5 and take the Discover test to learn a little bit more about how God's wired you for serving. That's the, probably the best place you can start. And finally, if we, want to miss, if we want to minister missionally like Jesus, we need to take on this last and maybe most important attitude of Jesus. Jesus was obedient. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming, obe by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. In other words, Jesus, it was Jesus' relationship with God that directed how he engaged people who didn't know God. Jesus didn't minister missionally on his own. He always did it with God's direction and God's help. 
It was Jesus' prayer life that fueled his mission and ministry. It was the time that he spent with God that gave him the confidence and the direction to live like he did. Before almost all of his important decisions, before so many of his miracles, and in all of his most important moments, we find Jesus in prayer. I think the most vivid place we see this is in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden, we find Jesus wrestling with God in prayer before heading to the cross. Jesus asks two times to not have to go. We see just how fully human Jesus is and realize that he had to trust God just as much as we do. In fact, I think he had to trust God even more. God was asking Jesus to trust him enough to be rejected by him. He's never asked us to do that. That must have made absolutely no sense to Jesus. The cross must have seemed like the most painful possible option, and God was asking Jesus to take it. And his answer was, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus could say that because to him, God was absolutely trustworthy. Even when things didn't make sense, and even when what God was asking for seemed like the worst possible decision. And that came out of his relationship with God. Jesus knew that he could trust God, even in this, because God had proved it to him so many times before. He knew it because he had spent so many hours in prayer with God, and he had seen so many of his prayers answered. And he knew it because he knew that the God revealed to him in the Bible was the God that he knew personally. Jesus' missional ministry came out of his relationship with God, and ours can too. The same God that Jesus trusted in is the one sending us out and promising to be with us. And more than that, we already know what the result of uh, of trusting God with our obedience will be. See, Jesus was obedient even to death. Jesus has showed us what it looks like to be obedient. And the result was that therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The end result of our obedience will be every tongue calling Jesus Lord, and that's the goal of missional ministry. As a church, we want to be ministering both attractionally and missionally, And we can continue ministering more missionally by taking on the same posture that Jesus had, by becoming humble, incarnational, service-oriented, and obedient. Let's pray.